Cypher 3 here. So this wasn't actually a DIY sort of build your own cabinet, this was more of a conversion from an old medication trolley. And how did I get that medication trolley? Well, I work in a supported living kind of care home setting, the uh, lock on it had broken. Uh, so they asked me to take it to the tip and it of course went to the tip of me. I looked into having a new lock, I thought well let's have a look see how much these new locks cost and they were about 90 quid. That's what I could find off of Alabama or whatever it's called. So um, yeah, like, I totally justified a reason for wanting to get rid of it but like I say, what is one man's waste is another man's gold and this is my man's gold and I left it in my shed for probably about four or five years, maybe a little longer, six, seven. Uh, so rather than all my tools in three or four boxes, I decided to combine them in one space. So the door that opens, there was one per spec shelf and I tried to replicate that to start off with. It's gonna be a little bit too difficult to do so. I kind of simplized the version, keep it stupidly simple, keep it sweet sort of thing. Make no excuse for the crappy old welds that's on there. Um, but it was with an AC welder, which I am going to be transferring nearer to the date. So a DC welder, and I might put some smoothing capabilities into that. So it might be a bit more of a, a um, like a zero, or it might have a, like a bit of a rippled effect. Obviously, I had to degrease everything, and to do that, I used oven cleaner and hot soapy fairy up liquid. Used a hot air gun just to try and help melt some of that grease back into like the bearings and everything. Kind of worked okay. It would have been ideal to have like a nice little syringe where you could syringe it up and just syringe it into the, um, the cavity of where the bearings were. Ideally I could do with some wheels with some locking devices in it because if it is on a bit of a slant it tends to roll away. Now the door also uh, where the lock goes I'd fit it with a lock from Screwfix. Um, I believe it was about a tenner or so. But I kind of had to bang a few little holes in there, then detentations, just to try and get a screw in there to sit flush whilst the door shut properly. And also I can attach a bungee rope going from the lock to the handle at the back. And that keeps it, the, the door sprung open um, for if it's on a bit of a slant, it won't sort of want to fold back and close on itself. Sanding it down, I used about 80 grit. Um, cheap stuff from Screwfix, I'll try and put a link in the bottom. Obviously I could have sanded it back down to bare metal, but I didn't and for those reasons uh, this was probably powder coated and sanding it back to bare metal and then putting on a spray that I applied is probably not going to be as strong as keying it back into the powder coat, which is what I've done, and then applying what I chose as the top coat paint, which was Hammerite. Now, Hammerite, you tend to love or you hate. Um, the, there's a key to using Hammerite, and the key is to leave it for as long as possible before touching it. So like three weeks is kind of the bare minimum. You can always tell because you can put your thumbnail onto the part and it sort of, you can then see the print of your thumbnail. It hasn't really fully hardened off yet. Okay, it might be dry to the touch, but it's not dry to the extent of it's going to take some uh, wear and tear and some battering. So the longer you can leave it, the better. Okay, so with Hammerite, it's a bit finicky. So to thin it, which is what I needed to do to use the gun that I used as the spray gun, and to thin it down to the right viscosity, I needed to use the proper Hammerite thinners. Now you can use other thinners, but it's not guaranteed and Hammerite is quite a finicky product like it. So it's always best to use Hammerite thinners, paint restorer, paint brush cleaner. So here I had a little bit of problem with the um, air pushing the paper up because I didn't mask and tape it. So in the end, I decided to scrap that and uh, just spray my workbench and my workmate blue at the same time. I mean, it's going to protect it, you know, with the things already shafted anyway. Um, we could do some new jaws and everything. So I thought, what the hell, might as well just paint the whole thing blue. I'd kind of just started spraying when it fell off. Um, but it's, it's, it's just one of those things where you got to sort of smile and carry on and get the job done sort of thing. So after sanding it down, obviously there's quite a bit of dust on there. I used this um, dog blower, uh, pet dryer sort of thing. Um, in which I made an attachment to go on to the end of the nozzle. Um, having a 3D printer allows you to do this. Now, not knowing this, but my paint spraying gun 
It kind of works on the same principle as having this uh, pet dryer. But having one of these um, pet blower dryer things is quite handy if you're working in the engine bay and you're going to be doing anything on the injectors or anything like that and you just want to clear the engine bay of any dust or grime and leaves and everything like that. You just go around you can just blow everything off. Same as if you've been working in the workshop, if you've been at the back of the garage and you need to, uh, you've been sanding a lot, grinding a lot and you need to blow all that dust out the front of the garage. You can just come to the back with it and just, just hose it all down and blow it out the front sort of thing so the, the, these sort of things are quite really handy to have it's just not for pets it's like a heavy duty hair dryer basically on steroids and they're, they're quite handy to have so I recommend getting one of these so before spraying um, obviously um, I gave a clean over with white spirit which um, I think in America you might call white spirit something else um, so that's just to release any crud and grease and everything on there. Obviously it puts down a thin film of oil, kind of oil based, um, but I'm spraying over it with like an oil based paint so it doesn't really matter as much as what it would do if you're spraying over with something else. Again, there's so many different recipes for paint mixtures at the moment. Um, like everybody's got their own different version of something and recommends something over something else. So just check uh, to see products. But with Hammerite that's thinned down with thinners, um, which is kind of like oil based anyway, um, it didn't sort of, uh, didn't, didn't, it didn't seem to be too much of a problem. So I'm just using a hot air gun here just to help dry the paint off and bring the metal up to temperature. That was more so to blow any moisture and allow the paint to get um, a, a good bond and a good attachment to something. Because um, it, it was around the uh, February time that I was doing this. So obviously I wanted the paint to hit the metal that was kind of warm anyway and create a good bond rather than it to be more of a, a, a reaction against what it's supposed to be bonding onto. But yeah, I only used one coat of Hammerite. I thought one coat would be enough. Putting a bit of gaffer tape um, down the sides of things just help protect the corners, the place that's gonna take a bit more rough and tough and sort of tear and, 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 and hit things first. I kind of thought I'd protect it. So the pop rivet machine is what I call it because it is a machine is uh, if you look at a, a standard pop rivet where you gotta put it in and, and, and pump it is, it's okay, but this one you just pull it back and put the pot rivet in it and bang, and pump it in maybe two, three times, hitting it in, you can keep that force on there and you can just bang it in there. And then that's not the best bit. The best bit of using a pot rivet machine is obviously getting rid of this spindle or the stem of the old pot rivet that you just popped. So with this, you just pull it back, tilt it down, it flies out the bottom, get it ready, put it on the new one and get popping away on the second one. That's the best thing about this machine. It's about 16, 17 quid. I'll put the links down below. So I looked through a lot of forums about what to um, align my trays with and uh, a lot of things that popped up was um, the sort of non-slip grip sort of things that you can get, the, um, the, the, the sort of cross things that you can get from the pound land and everything. They think they go and cut the drawers and everything like that. Just down the road, there was um, a, a, a pond shop that was closing down, uh, fish weld shop, etc. And um, I popped down there just on the off chance to see what I could find. And I walked outside and saw all, all this pond liner, and it was a uh, heavy duty pond liner. It wasn't like your PVC stuff, it was more of the rubber based uh, butamol sort of kind of material. So I asked them how much was it, and, and I managed to get a score of this stuff that was really quite cheap. Like, I think I paid two three quid for this great big sheet that you can see in the video which to me was like music to my ears like i was just gotta have it you know that in the tool line it would just be invaluable you know what i mean it's it's rubber it's it's resistant to probably like quite a lot of oils and petrols and rough and tough and scuff and stuff and i tend to like attached it with like um double-sided carpenters, um, not carpenters, uh, carpet tape sort of thing. Um, and this stuff is really sticky and it has got a good bond and a good hold to whatever you stick it to. So you kind of got to be like, put it down and know where you want to stick it before you stick something on it. But because this is rubber, where I had the door that opened in the flip up sort of tray, a couple of times it wasn't really sticking. For some reason now it is sticking. Um, but even if it didn't stick for those other bits, the trays and everything like that, it made sense to put that down first. It's quite a thin film and it, it would just help with slipping 
and that so it, it it makes sense you know to get these cheap little runners were ideal but obviously they're independent so i needed to um link them together and the only way i could link them together was like two little links two bars that went across and then from that the uh the tray that would sit on top of it now these were right angled pieces of aluminium and i kind of cut a slit down them and where i didn't want the the bit to fold up like because they're kind of like this and where i wanted this to then fold up i kind of bent this over and then folded that up and then drilled through this double sort of part now because it's aluminium you kind of work hardens um you can fold and bend it like kind of like once i probably won't want to unfold it because i think if you unfolded it the metal would have been that hard and fatigued that it would have kind of split and torn even doing it once on maybe one or two of the shelves it kind of was showing me that it was kind of reached its maximum limit of like um, um, stretchability, like whatever the word is, elasticity to get around to fold over. Obviously when the uh, tray is placed on it and then the holes drilled inside, there's four holes drilled inside, it creates a, a rigid sort of bed for it. The trays were um, from, they're like an Ikea thing. And I've actually seen some bigger trays like that look quite handy for things. I saw them in like a B and B, but um, these these trays, like well the smaller trays, um, they've gone up in price now. I think when I looked at them, they're like two pound each. I think they've gone up to like six pound each now. I had to I had to cut some notches in mine, and actually had to sand them back down a bit further on, which you don't see in the original video because I made they they were a little bit too long. By the time you had the rails and the inside of the rails to go in and out. I just had to sand them down a little bit, but it wasn't a problem. And uh, just using a bit of flame over the uh, rail drill of the holes just helped to like remelt the plastic. I don't think it's a PP, but it's um, not HDPE. It's kind of somewhere in between, like a blend. Um, your, your drill tip will cut into it, but if it sort of you've got a bit of a blunt drill tip, it will then catch it and snag it and and crack it rather than sort of cut into it sort of thing so obviously make sure your drill tips are like really nice and sharp when dealing with any sort of plastics really some plastics are better to melt a hole through um with like a soldering iron or a hot rod or, or, or something with temperature rather than actually cutting so the 3d putting the parts like um i'm gonna put on thingiverse and everything and i'm gonna put links in this video to them on thingiverse um a lot of them I started off trying to make all fancy like with the sockets that will go in and the sides that will come up and around to the socket and try and hold it into place and all this and I realised that prints like that take longer because you've got an edge in and whenever you create like an extra edge in and obviously you've got extra shells that go around the edge and it's taking longer to do it rather than using like an infill. So I kind of went back to basics and kind of kept like a flat bit for if I wanted it up on the side. Um, or like just, just flat with the like nipples pointing outwards and, and and those like kind of nipple bits are quite good in a way because if um if you find out that they're a little bit too loose you can put a bit of super glue on and um with that super glue you can then um, put a bit of bicarbonate of soda on it which creates like a bit of a chain reaction and sort of sets off the super glue and hardens it in place which then obviously creates a bit more of a layer on your on your part which then makes a bit more friction for it to go in and there's other things that's on there um like the um pro foot spanners so i've kind of made an adapted like i had two different designs for them um one was held together through the pressure of them staying together and the other one's a bit slightly different so the etching um i believe i got that um video um from gilmore i don't know if it's happy gilmore but I think this chat was called Gilmore. I'll put the link to his video in the description. The nail varnish, obviously I've got a door, nail polish, nail varnish, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's, it's quite a good make, but it didn't last for very long. Aluminium, uh, cleaned with IPA, um, the scan and cut um, template, PVA glued onto the side, nail varnish all around the outside, peel off and clean the uh, residue from the transfer and the um, PVA glue and then you're ready to apply current to it so um, 
it's like a salt solution and it does actually get quite hot yeah, it does it's quite really quite warm it kind of almost like burning and steam that comes out of it and you kind of use it i think i used it for about two minutes or four minutes on it uh keep dabbing it in your salt water solution and then brushing it on and that kind of then kind of like um what's the word kind of like cuts into the aluminium and 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 leaves you like a um etching kind of sort of figure on it now this bit's where kind of run it will run and I kind of rushed this process using the um, the halogen light heater there just to dry it out quicker but um, it created too much of a thick skin so when I pulled it back off actually had to use that scan and cut machine again and use um, a proper sort of poly film kind of adhesive sticker thing which is what is on there now. <laughs> 